Good morning, First Baptist Church. Glad to see you here today. It's an awesome day to be here. We want to welcome everybody who's joining us online as well. And if you're online, we want to invite you to share, uh, like, make some comments online too. We want to be engaging with you as well. And if you're here today and you are a guest with us, we are so thankful God sent you here today. We don't think you're here by accident. We think God sent you here for a reason, and that is to join in corporate worship and to learn more about him and to praise him today. And so there's a connection card in front of you. If you want to take a second and you can fill that out, you can drop it off in one of the offering the white chicken buckets on the way out today. And uh, we want to connect with you, share with you about what God is doing in the church here. But more importantly, we want to hear what God is doing in your life. And so if you're online, we ask you to do the same. You can just do that in the comments section, and we want to connect with you and encourage you as well. And so with that, let's stand. We're going to pray and prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God this morning. Lord, you are good and gracious and kind. Lord, we thank you for your promises, the promise that your mercies are new every single morning. And Lord, as we come in here today, gathered together to worship you, to learn more about you, God, to have our lives changed and conform to the image of Jesus, I pray the burdens that we walked in here with, I pray the concerns that we have, the things laying heavy on our hearts, God, that you would take those from us, that we would focus on you, that this time of worship through song would be a sweet aroma to you, God. And Lord, as we study your word, that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher today, and you would make us more like Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Bring your time, bring your shame, bring your guilt, and bring your pain. Don't you know that's not your name? You will always be much more to me. Every time I wrestle with the voices that keep telling me I'm not right, that's all right.
singing that song because it has the words in the Bible, the greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You know, the Bible from the front to the back, Genesis to Revelation, it's full of books of poetry and law and prophets and history and all of these ways. But all of it is compiled for one reason, and that is that it's a love story. It tells the story of how Jesus died and rose again for us who don't deserve it. I know that I've been, not been faithful to him my whole life, but he has been faithful to me because he loves me.
you have a copy of the scripture, just hold it up like this and say with me, this is my Bible, God's holy word, a lamp unto my path and a light unto my way. It's inerrant. It's infallible. It's authoritative. It's more powerful than any sharp two-edged sword. It is fire shut up in my bones. I must speak it. It is food for my soul. I'm ready now to receive it. You may be seated. Our series in the book of James is faith that works. And we have a faith that works. It works for me, it works for you. And it works for me, and it works for you, and it'll work for everybody. And we are talking today in James chapter two, beginning verse one. The title is, Love People God's Way. Love People God's Way. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man with filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. Listen, my uh, beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Loving people God's way will enable people to respond with grace and gratitude and empower them to become people they would never be otherwise. Several years ago, our family moved into a neighborhood and the neighbor next door had been a Army Special Forces. I knew he was really tough, the way he barked at his kids. He was like a drill sergeant. And I wasn't in a hurry to meet him. But one morning we met, because his son was out in the front yard beating up on my son. And I had to get out there to save my kid's life. And as I was going out the door, I seen him coming out the door. And he looked at me, first words he said to me, what are you going to say about this? I'm going to say they're acting like kids. We need to help them to grow up. He said, that's all you're going to say? That's all I'm going to say. He said, what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor. He said, where at? I said, First Baptist Church. He said, I'm going to your church. And he did. Not once, not twice, but he continued to come. And during the time we lived there, they became our closest friends. When you respond to people with God's love, it empowers them to respond with grace and gratitude and to become people they would not become otherwise. I want us to look at this uh, scripture today under the heading, Loving People the Way God Loves. And there's four commitments here that if we all commit to these four things, it will help us love people God's way, so that these people that we love can respond with grace and gratitude and be empowered to become people they wouldn't become otherwise. Are you okay with that? Are you on board with that? Give God praise. It's time to begin. Number one, loving people God's way requires us to love people like God loves people. You say, well, that just seems like double talk. No, if you think about it, in verse 1, the model is Jesus. 
under, uh, in verse 1 of chapter 2, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Jesus is the model. Faith in Jesus will require us to love the way Jesus loved. Now, if you ever thought about it, Jesus is the picture of God. He's the greatest picture God ever took. If you see Jesus, you see the Father. So if you see the way Jesus loves, that's the way the Father loves. Jesus is our model. When Jesus came to uh, Samaria with his disciples, and he sat at the well, and his disciples went on to get something to eat, Jesus uh, saw a woman come to the well. And the first thing he did, which, which was very uncommon, was he spoke to the woman was uncommon, it was not expected. It was against their culture. Not only that, but the woman was a Samaritan who was an outcast, half-breeds. They were hated, they were despised, they were outcasts. Jesus knew she was a Samaritan. Knowing she was a woman and knowing she was a Samaritan, he talked to her, he approached her. We need to understand under Bible study note B, faith in the Lord Jesus, and partiality is absolutely unacceptable. If we're going to love people the way God loves people, Jesus must be our model. And as Christians, if we have faith in him, we cannot have partiality at the same time it's unacceptable. It's not just poor taste. It's not just bad manners. It's not just sad. It's not just disgusting. But verse uh, 4 says, it is evil. It is evil. And verse 9 says, it is a sin to have faith in Jesus and partiality at the same time. It is just unacceptable. Amen? Amen. We can't do it. When uh, I was in Fort Bragg uh, for a time and uh, living in a trailer park, I had a friend who was a black man who wanted me to help him find a place to rent for him and his family. They wanted to live off base. I spent the whole day with him. We were turned down from apartments to trailer parks to houses. He even, he was a little light complected, so he even told him he was Spanish. It didn't help. They had prejudice. They had no room for him. I took him home uh, in our trailer to have supper that night because it had been an exhausting day. And uh, he had supper, and we I took him back on base. The next morning, we had the trailer park police, self-appointed police, visit our trailer. Said, you have to leave the trailer park because you have a black man living with you. I said, we don't have a black man living with us, but you know it would do me honor to leave your stinking trailer park if that's the way you feel about black people. We cannot hold faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and be partial. It is absolutely unacceptable. It's not bad manners. It's not poor taste. It's not sad. It's not disgusting. It's evil. And we need to realize that. I didn't fall. You say, well, pastors surely are not given to that kind of thing. They don't show partiality. It's amazing how Christians like us and preachers like us have this partiality in us and don't even realize we do it. When I was in seminary, my preaching professor told about uh, a final exam. A final exam that he was giving all the preachers and it was to be a sermon they would preach on video. And that was the final exam. They always to preach the same sermon on the Good Samaritan. You remember the story. Jesus said, if you want to be a good neighbor, be like this Good Samaritan. Because here's a man that went from Jericho up to Jerusalem, and he fell among thieves. And they left, they left him bruised and bleeding along the roadside. And here came a Levite who was a great church man. And instead of helping the man who was bleeding and, and bruised, 
he walked to the other side of the road and went on ahead, left him. And then came along a priest and did the same thing, walked across the other side of the road and left him. And then a Samaritan. The Samaritan's an outcast. He's a nobody. He's despised. He's hated. But he goes and binds up the wounds, pours in oil and wine, and takes him to an inn where he pays his rent or whatever until he is able to move out on his own. Jesus said, that's the kind of person you need to be. If you're going to be a neighbor, be like that good Samaritan. Well, so the final sermon, or the final exam was on video, preaching a uh, sermon on the Good Samaritan. What these preachers didn't know while they were scheduled at different hours, they were told they couldn't come in the front door because there was work going on. They'd have to come in the back door through an alley. And what they didn't know, that there was going to be a man lying in the alley that looked beat bleeding, and bruised. And how many of these would-be preachers that come to our churches and pastor our people would step across this man beaten and bloodied and bruised to go in and preach a sermon on the Good Samaritan? How many would step across him? None. No, every one of them. So don't sit here this morning and say, I don't have any partiality in my life. I don't have any prejudice in my life. What we need to do this morning is say, Lord, shine your spotlight on my heart. And where there is partiality, where there is prejudice, where there is bias, convict me of it and cleanse me of it now and forever. Give him praise if you're willing to let that happen. The second way, or the second commitment that we need to make to love people God's way is that we must commit to value people the way God values people. To value people the way God values people. Under A, the word chosen in Ephesians 1.4 means that God values us and he chose us and what is so mind-boggling he did this before the foundation of the world he didn't wait to see how you were going to turn out he chose you he chose you to be according to verse 5 chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith in the NIV it says chosen uh, those that uh, poor in the world in the eyes of the world those that are poor in the eyes of the world, he chose rich in faith. It's not just people who are poor, but people who were poor in the eyes of the world. I don't know if you know this, but it's a newsflash. Christians are not really the elite in the world. No. Christians are the people you put down, ridicule, humiliate, and nobody takes up for us. We are the people who are poor in the eyes of the world. And he has chosen us because we're rich in faith. And you know what? We need to be the people that values people the way God values people. Not because they're rich in the world, but because they're rich in faith. Several years ago, we had a family move to our church. And their last name was Van Dykes. How many of you know Walter and Deanna Van Dyke? Whoa. Everybody that hadn't, that had been in church, you know, Walter died about five years ago. But when they started coming, about 20 years ago over at Kingston, it didn't take our people very long to value Walter. They realized how rich he and his wife were in faith. He was invited to a life group to attend. Quickly, he was invited to take over the life group as a teacher. And even quicker was he invited to take over the second life group. And he was 
leading two life groups on Sunday morning and going to church in between. For years, he did that. And he was invited to be a deacon. And he was involved in visitation on a regular basis, involved in missions, doing everything. This church recognized that they valued the one God valued because he is rich in faith. Sad to say, Walter came to us because a church he was going to told him to leave. I don't know if you've ever been asked to leave a church, but Walter was. One of the greatest leaders in our church was asked to leave a church. Pastor said, you got to go. Hit the road, Jack. And after he left, there was a big hole in the church. Duh. There was a vacancy. There was an emptiness. And the pastor called Walter and said, would you come back? Please come back. Come back. We need you. We miss you. We'll have a revival. Everything will be good. And Walter went back, took his family back. And they stayed there for a while, and then the preacher said the same thing again. Walter, you got to go. I can't have you in this church any longer. Hit the road, Jack. And that's when Walter came to our church. And our church recognized how valuable he was. We valued the one that God valued, rich in faith. And the preacher called Walter after he'd been here and taught a life group a few weeks or a month, said, come back. There's a hole in our church. There's an emptiness. We miss you. Come back. Walter said, no, thank you. This time I'm staying at First Baptist because they know how to love a little guy like me. If you know Walter, give him praise that God brought him here. He took him home, but he left him here with us. It's sad that there are churches and there are people similar to us that don't value those that God values. Last uh, couple of weeks, you guys gave us a celebration for going part-time and becoming preacher emeritus. You know, I'm just very thankful that uh, there's a little part here that I can play at 74. Uh, I'm just thankful to be able to drink coffee in the morning. But you guys are so good. And you gave us a celebration and you wrote nice cards. You know, I, I don't know if you meant those things, but you're good writers. <laughs> you're good writers. And I got them laying at home and we'll pull them out when I get depressed and see what they said. But one of the greatest things that happened two weeks ago was... Uh, Mark and Carla Wells brought Jerry McQueen from Marysville, and he was out at the shelter house. Jerry McQueen was in our past about 40 years ago. And my daughter, Cindy, and Mark and Carla introduced him as the Marble Man. Now, most of you know this story, but some of you may not. But when I, when I uh, met Jerry and witnessed to him, visited him, he was very slow, very slow. He wasn't interested in being a Christian. But he came to church on a Sunday night. And when I was preaching at the end of the service, everything was quiet. I give the invitation. I thought I was just going to go home. Nothing's going to happen. And I was ready to give the benediction when my son in the back row dropped a marble he was playing with. And there was no carpet on the floor. It was a wood floor. And it sounded like a cannonball as it bounced all the way forward. As it got to my feet, I thought I'd wring his neck. But Jerry McQueen was standing there. Couldn't do that in front of him. Jerry came to get saved that night. I said, Jerry, how'd you get up here? He said, I figured that marble could do it. I could do it. <laughs> He's a marble man. But Mark and Carla brought him out here. I hardly recognized him. I'd seen him several times, but he changed. He's 79 years old. It was 40 years ago. I knew when we met Jerry, he was valuable. He was rich in faith. Just a little bit of attention, he grew like crazy. Now, he was a big man, but I'm talking about growing rich in faith. I invested in him. I visited with him. I, I had discipleship with him. I went out on visitation with him. One time on visitation, I was on my knees praying. He saw a hole in the bottom of my shoe. Next day, he bought me a new pair of shoes. 
From then on, every time we went out on visitation, I'd wear old shoes. <laughs> Jerry McQueen, you got to value those that God values, those that are rich in faith. He was rich in faith. And today he's the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Marysville, Ohio. To God be the glory. We must commit to value people the way God values people. So how valuable are you? How valuable are you? Under B, our self-worth is determined by how we love God. Jesus said the greatest commandment is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do you love him that much? Let me tell you, if you do, 1 John 4 1 John 4, 20 will help you decide if you love him that much. Here's how you can decide if you love God with all your heart. According to 1 John 4, 20, it says, you cannot love God who you have not seen unless you love your fellow man who you have seen. You determine how much you love God by how much you love one another. A little fellow was walking to church one Sunday morning in Chicago. Snow about six inches deep. Trudging up the hill, the people of First Baptist Church reached out and said, come on in, we got a fire going, you can get warm. He said, no, I'm going on up to D.L. Moody's church. They know how to love a little fellow like me up there. Do people know in this church how to love a little fellow like that? If we do, then we have great value with God. Give him praise for who he is today. <laughs> Under number three, honor people the way God honors people. We honor people under A by placing importance on them. Verse 6 and 8, you have dishonored a poor man. You have dishonored a poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into court. You have dishonored the poor man because you haven't made him important. How do we honor someone? By making them important. Tony and Betty were some of the poorest people that we'd ever met, Sharon and I. We went into their home, and immediately they greeted us, loved us, and gave their heart to Christ. They were the poorest people that you could ever meet physically, financially. Tony only had one coat. He wore it spring, winter, and fall was the poorest coat that you could imagine had Cleveland Browns written on it. That's how sad it was. Very sad. But we felt they were honored of God and we wanted to honor those that God honored because they were important. We felt they were important. They fed on the Word of God. I remember bringing Tom into a discipleship class and teaching him how to memorize scripture. He found it so easy to memorize certain scriptures. Some scriptures were just easier for him than others. Especially Jeremiah 32, 17. Do you know that verse? Ah, Lord God, behold, you have created the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arms. And they're what? Nothing too hard for you. Tom memorized that like that. I said, Tom, you're a poor boy. You don't have a good education. How do you memorize something like that? He said, very simple, Cleveland Browns. I said, I got that. He said, Jeremiah 32, 17. Jim Brown's number was 32. Brian Sipes' number was 17. Jeremiah 32, 17. Oh, Lord God, behold! <laughs> what an important guy he was. I took him with me on visitation. I taught him how to play golf. Not good enough for him to ever beat me, but I taught him how to play golf. He didn't have the money to play golf, but we found a way to get him there to play golf. And on Easter morning, all decked out in their new suits and dresses, I asked Tom to give the Sunday morning's message on Easter. Tom or Tony. Tony had a funny look about him. He didn't comb his hair. 
and his hair looked like it hadn't been washed for a few days, weeks. And that Cleveland brown coat, I don't think he'd ever washed that. He wore that on Sunday morning Easter. And he stood before the people in their, all their Easter garbs, and he gave one of the greatest messages from his heart. Brought tears to my eyes. This man was so honored by God because he was so important in the family of faith. And he blessed me so much. But when I wasn't looking, some of the other people said to him, we don't need people like you around here. God forgive people who are partial, who are prejudiced, and don't understand how to honor people that God honors. You honor them by showing how important they are and make them feel important. Under B, it's as important to know how to honor people as it is to know who to honor. How do you honor people? You got to know who to honor, but it's important to know how to honor them. How do you honor them? By showing them attention. Don't let them just sit by themselves. Don't let this just come into church and nobody speak to them. Give them attention. Have you ever noticed a little baby that don't know how to talk? Can't understand a word you say, but you look at it in the face and you just say a few words. That attention will cause that little baby to give you the most toothless grin you've ever seen in your life. Attention works. We need to give attention to people, whoever they are. If they're important to God, they have to be important to us. If, we, if God honors them, we have to honor them. Amen? Amen? So you give attention. You talk to them. You touch them. Now, I know that's not something you should say during the pandemic. But we're not always going to be in a pandemic, people. Amen? I want to tell you right now, this pandemic has hurt the church because the church flourishes when we hug each other and shake hands and touch each other. It's important. One medical study showed that the personal touch was absolutely essential in aiding healing in the body. UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles did a study and they said the human touch was necessary to maintain health and emotional well-being. The human touch. And the same study, UCLA, came out and said that a woman needs eight to ten meaningful touches a day. Now, frankly, that doesn't mean you hit her on the back and say, good old girl, that's not a meaningful touch. Eight to ten a day. Isn't it time we learn to show people how important they are? Even a little knuckle is better than no knuckle. But take those big rings off. You're killing me. You're killing me. <laughs> those big diamonds. Linda, take that big diamond off, please. And take them to eat. Invite them into your home. Sharon and I have been in many of your homes in the time we've been here. And it is a blessing. Some of you eat well. It is a blessing to get in your refrigerator. But I tell you what blesses a pastor and a pastor's wife more than coming to your home is to hear that you invited some new person in the church to your home. Somebody that nobody else paid any attention to. And right back here on my right side, last year, there was a new couple that really needed fellowship really needed a personal touch. And, uh, and, and we just don't have time to do it all. But we heard, we heard, there was a family that invited them to their Thanksgiving dinner and to their Christmas dinner and made them a part of their family. And that family that did that are not serving on any of the boards or any of the ministry teams. They're not serving in missions. But my goodness, they invited somebody that was a nobody home with them and honored those that God honored. And man, did it bless your pastor. I would love to hear it all over this congregation that you invited that new person 
or that lonely person, or that new widow, or that new widower, or that orphan. Bring him to your home. This is what God is wanting us to do. Give him praise if you're willing to give it a shot. Fourthly, we need to commit to forgive the way God forgives. In verse 9 through 12, but if you show partiality, you commit sin. It's not sad, it's not poor taste, it's not bad manners, it's sin. Prejudice, partiality, bias, it's sin. And you are convicted by the law of, of the transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Think about that. If you show partiality, you sin. And if you sin in one point, you sin in all. So if you show partiality, you're guilty of partiality, you're guilty of prejudice, but you're also guilty of adultery and guilty of murder. You're guilty of all. Under Bible study note A, if we break the commandment, we are guilty of all, we need forgiveness. Amen? Just ask the Lord. We're going to open the altar in a minute. You can come and pray for someone on your heart. Or you can come for pray for something that is on your heart. That you have treated someone poorly. I hope that we haven't read these scriptures and it just went over your head. I hope that we can sense where we have neglected the opportunity to love someone that needed love. And, and, and whether it's a widow or a widower or an orphan or a poor person or a new person. You know, when somebody comes in the first time, it's because they're looking for a church, they're looking for God, they're looking for a family. And we need to let them know that we love them when they come in. And if we haven't done that, let's ask God to forgive us. God, forgive me. Forgive me when I reach out to one of the leaders in the church and miss the opportunity to shake hands with that other person that has very few friends in the church. Can we do that? Can we ask God to forgive us of partiality and prejudice and bias and neglect? Under Bible study, no B. If people sin against us, they've hurt us. Every one of us here this morning have been hurt by somebody. You've been hurt by somebody. And we must forgive them. Because if they've hurt us and we don't forgive them, then they hurt us again. And the second hurt is much worse than the first hurt. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, you can. I had someone this morning come forward and somebody hurt them who had died a long time ago. There's no way for that person to come back and ask forgiveness. You got to be the one to forgive whether they, forgive, they ask forgiveness or not. You can't afford to carry that hurt around in your heart. We need to learn to forgive the way God forgives and commit to it. Thank God he forgives us. Totally, completely, all at once, forevermore, cast it in the sea of forgetfulness. Norman Vincent Peale was from Ohio. Uh, I got to hear him preach a couple of times. He was preaching in New Jersey once. At the end of the service, a lady come up and said, while you were preaching today, you caused me to itch. And I itch all over. I'm, I've been scratching, see, see my arms, how red they are? He didn't notice they, they were red, but she was itching inside and out. She was itching in her soul. And then she went on to tell him, every time she goes to church, she breaks out an itch. 
and usually follow with a fever. He said, well, why don't you come into the office and we'll talk. And she did. And he said, do you have a problem in your Christian life? Oh, no, I'm a good Christian. I go to church all the time, but every time I go to church, I itch. Well, he said, how about your family? Well, I get along. I have a good family. I said, anybody that you, ha that you have an uh, odd against? She said, no. Now, be, be honest, he said. Well, I do hate my sister. Why do you hate her? Well, when my parents died, she took more of the inheritance than I took. And I've hated her ever since. He said, could this be part of the problem? I don't know, I just hate her. He said, I think you should forgive her. She said, I don't know if I can. Do you want to itch forever, he asked. She said, no. And so he led her in a prayer. Lord, help me to forgive my sister. Lord, help me to mean it. Lord, help me to do it right now. I choose, Lord, he led her in the prayer, I choose today to forgive my sister and love her from here on out. Norman Vincent Peale said, do you really mean it? She said, yes. What's your sister's telephone number? He got her on the phone. He said, this is Norman Vincent Peale. Your sister wants to talk to you. And she said on the phone, honey, I love you. I forgive you. I, I am so sorry that we haven't spoken for all of these years. The end of the story, every time she'd go to church, no more itch, no more fever. Some of us are itching in our souls because we refuse to forgive the way God forgives. God forgives totally, completely. It was washed away by the blood of Jesus. And if you've got somebody that you can't love, because you have an odd against them, maybe you even hate them, you need to forgive them today. They hurt you once. If you don't forgive them, they hurt you again. And the second hurt is much, much worse than the first. So let's stand for prayer. And bow our heads. Father, we want to love people God's way. We want to love the way Jesus loved. We want to value people the way you value people. We want to honor people the way you honor people. We want to denounce partiality, prejudice, and bias. And we want to forgive like you forgave. And if there's someone today that we need to forgive, help us to do it. If someone has hurt us, help us to be honest and bring it to the altar and lay it all on the altar and forgive them so they can't hurt us anymore. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. If you're here and you know somebody that's not in church today because somebody hurt them, would you just hold up your hand and let us know that we should pray for them. God bless that hand and others. It's a sad thing that we hurt people, but we can forgive. And if we forgive, it'll help other people forgive. If there's someone that's hurt you, would you be honest enough to raise your hand and say, I need to forgive them people? Just raise your hand. God bless those hands going up. Father, we just ask you to help us do that right now, to forgive those that hurt us, to get everything clean in our heart. In Jesus' name. If you'd like to come and pray for someone or pray for yourself, if you'd like to receive Christ as your Savior, if you'd like to join the church, be baptized, you come, share with us on your heart. I'm forgiven. I'm accepted. You are condemned. I'm alive and well. Spirit is within me because you died and Amazing love, how can it be? You're my king, would die. 
or that verse that a king would die for us, God. So all throughout history, many, many people have died in the name of their king. But you, Lord Jesus, died for us. A king that would die for his people to give us eternal life and the hope that we can have only through you. So thank you for that, God. I thank you for your word today. I thank you for uh, the lives that have been touched and changed, Lord, here and also uh, online this morning, God. And um, just thank you also for the resources that you give us to enable us to do the work that you've called us to do. It's amazing all through scripture. You give us commands, you give us direction, but God, you never tell us to go alone. You provide the means necessary and you go with us. And so thank you for that. Thank you for the givers and uh, that are giving today through tithes and offerings, Lord. Just bless them, bless the use of it to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a few quick announcements today. Again, you can, if you have tithes and offerings, you can drop it off at the door on your way out. You can also give one of three ways. You always give in person, online, or um, through the mail, or you come by throughout the week and you can drop that off. If you give online, you can go to FBC, or firstgc.org, and there's a giving tab there, and you can sign up if you wanted to do that to give online. Um, exciting news coming up on October 19th, Monday night, there's a special business meeting that will be here at 7 p.m. in the Neal Auditorium, and the purpose of that is to consider the call of a student pastor. And so um, God's been faithful in working through that, and so I just pray that over the next few weeks that God would continue to make, make it known his will, and uh, we look forward to having an opportunity to see what God's gonna do in the future of student ministry. Speaking of students, um, this past Wednesday, uh, with Operation Christmas Shoebox starting today, they put together over 800 shoeboxes on Wednesday night. Uh, didn't fill them, but they folded them. You get to fill them. <laughs> so um, on your way out this morning, you can go uh, outside in a foyer, pick up a shoebox, one or two or three. It is such an easy way to share the gospel around the world through a shoebox. Um, a lot of people say, oh, it's so kids can get a Christmas gift. It is awesome to give kids something who may not have received anything, but more importantly, you have an opportunity to show them a love of Jesus. And many of these children have never heard the name of Jesus where these shoe boxes will end up. And so I encourage you to be part of that. You can pick up as many as you want outside. Um, also on the, link, on the website, there'll be a link later on this week when you can actually build a shoe box online. And so um, with social distancing and all those things, they're giving more opportunities for that. So I encourage you to be part of that. It's an awesome, awesome way to share the gospel. Also coming up on October 18th, at 7.14 p.m., we'll have an evening of prayer again, praying for a nation, praying for God to intervene, and just uh, more importantly, that we come in a prayer of repentance and that God would restore us and restore uh, his people to lead and to do the things that he's called us to do. So that's October 18th. Also October 18th is Baptism Sunday. If you've never followed through in Believer's Baptism, we want to encourage you to do that. You can contact us. We'll be happy to walk through scripture with you and um, to get you signed up for that. And then lastly, November 1st, new member class will start again at 1045. Um, if you want to know just more about what God is doing through the church here, you want to ask some questions where you can get a little more interaction, or you say, hey, I want to become a member of this church, and, what, and it's awesome what God's doing here. I want to plug in here, and I want to serve. I encourage you to sign up to be part of that. It's a four-week thing. We'll be done the Sunday before Thanksgiving at 1045. We'll then meet right across the hallway in the student center. So uh, with that, church, awesome, awesome morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your faithfulness. Go be the church and tell somebody about Jesus this week. Two, three, four.